This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat. Thank you for joining us for yet another episode of Tau Unbound. I'm Ido Aharoni here from Tel Aviv, and today it is my pleasure to host Professor Neta Erez. Hello, Ido. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for joining us. And let me just uh, make sure that I, I get your title correctly. Professor Neta Erez is the head of the Laboratory of Tumor Biology and Vice Dean of the Faculty of Medicine. And I know from doing some reading about you that your specialty is also in the field of pathology, right? I'm in the Department of Pathology. The Department of Pathology. It's not my specialty. And you're dealing with, uh, with solid tumors, right? So your, your, yes. your area of research is not, let's say, blood cancer, but rather melanoma or other forms of cancer. That's correct. And so uh, before we talk about your... Uh, you, we discuss your research. Uh, we're always curious to know more about the personal stories of our guests. So please tell us about your background, where you're from, and how did you end up doing what you're doing today? Okay. Um, I grew up in Estiona. Um, wonderful place. Yes. And I actually still live there now. Um I studied biology. My major in high school was biology. And then right after the army, I studied an undergrad in, in biology. And then I continued to the Weizmann Institute where I did my master's and my PhD. And I kind of went in a straight line. <laughs> I didn't take any, you know, any divergence or detours because I really, I really enjoyed what I was doing. Now, when... When you say that you uh, studied biology in high school, back in the day, uh, you know, it was very segmented, right? The people that were good in math went to, you know, study mathematics and the people. How did you, when did you discover that this is your, you know, the era that you're drawn to? I can tell you that from my experience, and I think I'm a bit older than you, uh, the people that went to study biology actually secretly, deep inside, wanted to be medical doctors. Um, that's an interesting point. So I guess I'll answer several things. Uh, one is how did I know that I'm interested in biology? So my mother was a biology, biology teacher in high school. Oh, okay. That explains a lot. And so she kind of was always telling us, you know, things about and explaining and, you know, making drawings. And on vacations, she would bring home a um, little microscope. And then we would take leaves from the garden and look, or, or onion peels, and look under the microscope. And we would go hiking in the hills around Estiona. There's like a nature reserve with a book that allows you to define flowers. So I always knew that I'm very interested in this. But I was also very interested in literature. So I had to kind of decide between the two in high school. And I went for biology, and I'm glad I did that. And going to your question about, uh, about being a doctor, I never thought about it. But then just before, when I registered to university, a lot of people told me, you know, you could get into medicine. Why would you want to study biology? So I, for the first time, really thought about it. And I realized that, no, I actually want to study biology. So it was a very conscious decision. I was always interested in, in knowledge and in research. The funny thing is that I found myself at the Faculty of Medicine teaching medical students, uh, mentoring MD, PhD students, and married to a doctor. So and, and, my and life I is should, full of physicians. And I, and I should say that you also won an award for doing such a great job mentoring students, if you can elaborate about that award and what you received the award for. Okay, so as part of being a, a principal investigator, I have PhD students and master's students and postdocs in my lab, and I'm their mentor. And this was actually one of the most pleasant surprises for me when I, you know, when I became an independent scientist and I got my own lab. I was always thinking forward towards... The amount of research and the, that now that I can only 
not only ask one question, but six different questions in parallel and move forward. And But what really took me by surprise is how much I enjoyed the mentoring and the training of young scientists. And, and I've been doing this very passionately, not only with my own students, but also adopting people along the way and young PIs. And at some point, um, a couple of years ago, uh, I got uh, the mentoring prize from Nature. And this was um, a very, very um, emotional prize for me because I was submitted to it by my mentees. So by my students and former students and adopted. Uh, and I'm sure that this, this gave you a great deal of satisfaction to know that the people that you're mentoring are actually the ones who recommended you for this. Yes, it was very nice. But the biggest satisfaction is just to see them moving forward. Now, do you have any students from abroad, from overseas? Um, I've had along the years. Right now, I think there's only ah, two. Right now, I have two. Uh, one from India, a postdoc from India, and a PhD student from Italy. Science is very international, and that's, that's part of the fun. And I think that uh, it, that's what makes it so effective. Because when you think about, you know, the people that developed, um, you know, the team that developed the vaccine for whatever it is, even COVID, th those were by definition international teams. And I think that's the way of the, of the future. Absolutely. We collaborate with people from Europe and from the U.S., from different countries. Now, and you're doing so many things. You, you, you know, share with us the secret of effective time management because you're mentoring tens of people. You're the vice dean, you have your own lab, you're teaching, you're researching. How do you manage your time? Uh, wow, that's a really good question. Um, I guess focusing. Of course, you have family. I do have family. Um, I guess focusing and trying not to, um, not to do things that are complete distractions. And I also try to divide my day to segments. So I decide which segment of the day goes to things that are my lab, um, my papers, my grants, and then a segment that goes to, you know, public uh, service, like things that I do for other people or for the faculty. Uh, and then there's a part devoted to my, uh, my, my own children <laughs> and my husband. Um, and I really try to keep it, you know, very uh, focused. I don't always manage because sometimes your inbox has a way of invading everywhere. Um, but I guess that's, um, that's overall, it's a good advice to try to segment your day. So let's go and talk a little bit about your actual uh, area of research, which is tumor biology. So first of all, if you can help us define the area Right, because we, we use the word cancer, it's a very general word that basically means tens of, if not more, hundreds of different diseases, right? So what is tumor biology? So my lab, I mean, we call it tumor biology, but my lab is uh, based on the understanding that is already based for several uh, decades, that tumors are not just a bunch of cancer cells, but they're actually better defined as multicellular organs. So a tumor is composed not just of cancer cells, but also cells of our body that are being kind of hijacked and recruited into the tumor, and we call it the tumor microenvironment. And that includes blood vessels and immune cells and stromal cells like fibroblasts that are actually becoming part of this entity that is called tumor. And what we're trying to uh, research in my lab is the interactions of cancer cells with their microenvironment. But specifically, you said that we're studying solid tumors. Specifically, what we're trying to understand and decipher is tumor metastasis. So most of mortality from cancer is actually not from the primary tumor. In many cases, uh, in breast cancer and in melanoma, for example, which are two uh, cancer types that we're studying in the lab, the primary tumors are being surgically removed. And people actually, if they, if they die, it's from the spreading of cancer cells to distant organs. And this is what we're trying to understand. 
um, I can tell you more about that. So, so uh, what you're saying is that if you understand the interaction between the cancerous cells and the system, the microsystem that is called the tumor, then you can learn about how they migrate to distant organs. Yes. So the migration is actually one of the... So metastasis is a very multi-stage process. But you said migration, so it's like the departure of cells from the primary tumor, let's say, in the breast, and migration to a different organ is one of the earliest stages of metastasis. What we're focusing on is actually once cancer cells reached, let's say, the bone or the liver or the brain or the lungs, now they actually meet a completely new environment. Let's think of, um, take for an example, a woman with breast cancer. So she has her primary breast tumor removed surgically, and then she's being treated, let's say, with chemotherapy or radiation after the surgery, trying to kill any residual, residual cells that the surgeon, you know, did not see or that may have spread. And then she's just being followed up, sometimes for two, three, two years, five years. She just has imaging, she comes for checkups, and everything is fine for a few years, and then suddenly there's metastasis in the bone, and we say the cancer is back, in the bone or in the lungs or in the brain. These are the main sites of breast cancer metastasis. Where did these cells come from? They came from the primary tumor three years ago, five years ago. So what were they doing there for three or five years? So what we're trying to understand is the early stages of metastasis. Once they get to a new organ, it's a new neighborhood. Growing in breast is very different to growing in bone or in brain. You need to learn a new language. Now you need to learn to speak bone or to speak brain. And for that, they need to interact with the cells of that organ. So what we're trying to do is to understand the organ-specific microenvironments that turn from trying to inhibit the growth of these cells. Again, they're being corrupted and hijacked. Like the microenvironment at the primary tumor, to start helping the cancer cells grow. And we're trying to understand these interactions, thinking that if we could block them, maybe we can inhibit metastasis, which is, like I said, the main reason for mortality from most solid tumors. So how do you make that leap, really, from understanding the interaction or understanding how those cells ended up in the bone from the original tumor to preventing them from blocking them from doing this? I'll give you an example from one of our recent studies. We found a certain molecule um, that was highly upregulated in the blood and in the brain of mice with brain metastasis, but also of people with brain metastasis. We always try, we work in mouse models because, you know, that's the way we can model cancer and that way we can look at early stages that are pretty much a black box in people. If you think of the example of that woman I told you, what is happening in the three years or five years be between the resection of the tumor and our ability to see the metastasis is a black box because this is when MRI or CT cannot see them, but they're there. In mice, we can also study these stages. So... Uh, what we found, and we always try to validate our findings in human patients. We collaborate with clinicians and we validate our findings. So we found a protein um, that is secreted and that is high, uh, very high in the, in the blood and in the brain, in the cerebral spinal fluid. And then we studied its role and we realized that it comes from immune cells that come from the bone marrow. They're recruited to the brain. Now that we know this, we try to block it. Uh, we use genetic ways. In mice, we can actually use genetic ways to uh, eliminate a certain protein. And then we significantly inhibited brain metastasis in the mice. Uh, mice with melanoma and breast cancer metastasis. So two different kinds of cancer. So if we find targets like that, that are important for the formation of metastasis, and we can target them therapeutically with, with an antibody or with some kind of an inhibitor that we can uh, give people. And if we do it before metastasis, then maybe we can, this is our vision, this is our hope, 
we can inhibit um, the metastatic relapse. For that, we need to do research that is organ specific, but it, because the, even though the principles are the same, the specific players, the names of the proteins that play a role will be different in each organ. So we need to know them and then develop ways to inhibit them. I have another example from lung cancer that we found and published, so a different protein. And there we actually did an experiment where we didn't do genetic blocking, but pharmacological blocking, because there was um, available an antibody. So we found a, a cytokine, a, a protein that, that we showed is important to create inflammation in the lungs, and this inflammation actually supported breast cancer metastasis to lungs. So we, have, we had mice that had um, primary mammary tumors, breast tumors. We resected the primary tumors. And then after resection of the primary tumor, we treated them with an antibody, sorry, with an antibody that blocks the cytokine. And they had less lung metastasis. So this is our vision. Now let's use our imagination. What will it take to scale this thing up? In other words, what will it take for humanity to be able to do that on a scale? Um, because what you're describing in many ways is a preventive, a critically important preventive tool. The for development the... of therapeutics is a long process because the time that passes from a discovery in a lab to the to having a drug that is available and approved can sometimes be a decade. And it's just the pathway that needs to go through and the link between academia and industry. Um, so if we could improve this, maybe we can shorten the timeline. But there's but still a lot the, of tests that need to be made. Yeah, what about the, ups, the scaling up of the diagnostics, not necessarily the therapeutics? In other words, to allow people just to know so if, if, if someone think that they, and I've heard so many stories of people that were convinced that they're, that's it, they're, it's behind them, the tumor was removed, and then two or three years later, something happens, right? There's a recurrence of the cancer in a different place. So if there's a diagnostic tool that will allow them, based on the behavior of that particular protein that comes in the brain or whatever it is that you're able to detect, I think uh, it could really change the face of medicine. So that's another area of research. We're not so much doing that, but other people are trying to find uh, blood markers. So one of the factors that we found could also be uh, a blood marker, but this is like a different uh, field of research, people that are trying to find markers that you can use, diagnostics that you can use to diagnose or predict um, and there's not going to be a shortcut. It has to be a lot of research um, on a... You said yourself that it's like 200 different diseases. And there are so many factors that influence this. I'll give you an example, not from my own research, but something that is now going on. So people are showing that whether or not someone will relapse or will have metastasis after resection of a primary breast tumor, also has to do with exercise, also has to do with stress, also has to do with circadian, with their circadian clock. So at different time points, there is uh, fluctuations in the, um, in the travel uh, of cancer cells in the blood. This is such a multifactorial uh, process that determines who of the people that had their primary tumor removed will actually in a few years have clinically relevant metastasis. Uh, what we can try to do is, you know, we, we're each doing our research that contributes to this, but at the end, it will have to be consolidated to a very complex and multifactorial picture. And I'm not sure we will be able ever to predict uh, with 100% certainty where and who it will happen to. Right. So you mentioned something that I know is of a uh, great deal of interest to our audience, which is lifestyle choices and, and how we link them 
to the occurrence of, of forms of cancer. So you spoke about the importance of uh, exercise, of working out. Yeah. You spoke about the importance of reducing the levels of stress. Absolutely. I think um, sleep is a lot. Sleep. Has a lot to do with it, right? Yeah. People, people need to because the immune system needs that time to recover every day. Yeah. So, um, so um, what would you um, recommend by way of, you know, applied science uh, to our audience? in terms of based on your research? So this is not based on my research. Um, like I said, we're studying the molecular mechanisms of, of communication of disseminated cancer cells with their microenvironment. Based uh, on your experience, not research. Based on my accumulated knowledge from, you know, the things I'm reading and the research, uh, research researches that I'm exposed to, um, having a balanced and healthy lifestyle, uh, which is something that we, I mean, at this point, we pretty much know what that means, um, is very important, not just for our general uh, well-being, but also it has to do with our ability to cope with cancer. So let's talk about the future a little bit. So you, um, you studied melanoma, you studied breast cancer. What's next for you in terms of um, the goals? of your research? So I kind of mentioned it briefly, but specifically, my goal is that we will get better in being able to prevent metastatic relapse rather than what we're doing now, which is trying to treat overt metastatic disease. Right now, when we discover metastasis, when we have the ability to, to actually image it and see it, it's, it's usually incurable. So with the exceptions now of melanoma that responds to immunotherapy, where there have been uh, quite a few cases of people that had metastatic disease, but are, um, you know, we're using the word cure very carefully, but starting to use it. So with this exception, overall, we do not cure metastatic disease. We can maintain it uh, for a while. So what... I'm hoping, and again, it's, it's a vision. What I'm hoping is that we will have enough knowledge, both from research such as my research and from genetic stratifications of uh, cancer that will, and diagnostic tools like you mentioned that will allow us to predict once we have a patient with a primary tumor, let's say a woman with breast cancer, to predict, okay, according to the genetic profile of your a primary tumor that we have resected, and according to other tests that we have made, you have a high probability of, uh, let's say, bone metastasis. So from now on, take this. So I'm thinking of drugs that will block uh, the pathways that I mentioned that allow cancer cells to thrive in distant organs that can be administered or taken chronically um, to prevent metastatic relapse. So in a sense, I guess my dream or my vision is that we will be able to turn cancer into um, chronic, chronic disease. disease. Yeah. Like just as they did with HIV. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's, uh, that's a worthy vision. Well, uh, you know, have. if you already have a vision, might as well have it be worthy. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's, that's big. And, uh, and, you know, and obviously if the, if this can come out of Israel, if this can come out of Tel Aviv University, that would be huge. And uh, working on it. Yes, yes. So, so tell us, uh, how can our community and and obviously this podcast is about and for the community around Tel Aviv University, and obviously other people that are interested, but most of our listeners and our viewers are friends of the university. How us as a community can be of help to you in your really sacred work? Um, so what, you know, what helps us move forward is infrastructure and support. And we spend a lot of our time struggling uh, to get both. So any improvement in our infrastructure and in our support for research is blessed and will help us move forward faster. Well, and I think that um, our... Um our, our listeners and our viewers heard you uh, because I think that 
you know, it's important to help and support every department in the university. Uh, but when you really deal with something that is so visionary, that has the potential of, of really uh, changing the status of, of a disease that is killing so many people every year all over the world, and, um, and you know, we should do everything that we can in order to help you as a community. And I, uh, and I mean that, and I, and I ask our friends out there to, uh, to think about what you just heard, which is really amazing. What a, what a vision. Thank you so much. All right. So, you know, we can, we can continue this conversation for a long time, but uh, we're running out of time. And I wanted to, first of all, thank you for being here. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for educating us about your important work and uh, to ask you to have the permission to invite you again. Sure. In the near future. I'll be happy to. And uh, from Tel Aviv, I'd like to thank you for being with us until our next episode. Goodbye from the Tel Aviv University campus. This is Taiwan Bound, the English language podcast of Tel Aviv University. Please welcome your host, Ido Aroni, Tel Aviv University's graduate, member of the Board of Governors, lecturer, writer, and veteran diplomat.